Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Tuesday Club. I'm Maura Styles, and I'm the president of the Target Settlers Association. So just a couple of wee um, news items to begin with. Our AGM is on Thursday the 21st at 7 p.m., and it's here, so you're all welcome to come. Also, if anyone's not a member and they'd like to join, they can join by either going to the reception desk or contacting our receptionist, Jude. And if anyone would like to stand for the committee, they can come and see me and I'd be very welcome to have a talk to them. So that's enough of the general information. Now today's talk for the Tuesday Club is Catherine Hammond. So I welcome Catherine Hammond and she's the librarian at the Hocken Collections. Catherine has had two decades plus working in Auckland at the Art Gallery and the Auckland War Museum. She's going to share stories of her time and her various activities in the culture centre. And she's also going to tell us about her current job and her favourite items of the collection. So welcome, Catherine. Thank you, Moira. Can everyone hear me OK? <laughs> Show of hands. No, I'll uh, move this a little closer. I'm quite tall. <laughs> I'm Catherine Hammond, Hocken Librarian, and um, it's a pleasure to be speaking today at the Tuesday Club. Um, as you probably know, Otago University is home to one of Aotearoa's most significant research libraries, Hocken Collections. Established in 1910, it's an invaluable teaching and research resource which is open to everyone. Who's, who's visited Hocken here? Who knows Hocken? Wow. <laughs> Wonderful. We recently uh, commemorated the 116th anniversary of the signing of the Deed of Trust between Dr Thomas Hocken and the University of Otago, in which he presented his library to the people of Aotearoa, New Zealand, uh, making it freely accessible to all. So I'm really glad to hear that people are using it here. Um, so for this morning's talk, as Maura mentioned, I'll tell you a little bit about my career to date, uh, and then about Hocken and our future plans and aspirations. So, oh, it's working. Here's Rangi Toto in Tamaki Makaurau, Auckland, and this is a photo from the Hocken collections. This was my view on my way to work. Um, to Auckland Museum every day and that's the previous role I had um, as Head of Documentary Heritage there before coming to Otipoti Dunedin um, and Hocken Collections. So I'm an Aucklander, born and bred, don't hold that against me. Um, it's my first time living in Te Waipunamu and um, I've visited this part of the country many times. So who am I? Um, I trained as a librarian at Victoria University after completing an art history degree at Auckland University. And my mother tells me that my first words were, read a book <laughs> uh, at about two or three years old. And I guess the die was cast. And following my education, I worked as a librarian in Wellington for a number of years. And later, I stepped sideways into a career with New Zealand tourism, living in Los Angeles for a time. Uh, returned home and started a likely never to be completed law degree um, and around this time I got my first role in the cultural heritage sector as the E.H. McCormick Research Library Manager at Auckland Art Gallery Toyo Tamaki and I loved it so much I stayed for nearly two decades. So these are some of the themes of my career to date. Um, and some of the things that I care about and value in the work that I do. And some of these things may come out as I talk a little bit about some of the work I've done. So here's boxes of archives. So when I went to Auckland Art Gallery, my aim was to make the library and archive more than just a wonderful research resource but absolutely central to the work of the gallery and active in projects in its own right. So creating tangible outcomes such as publications or exhibitions from a starting point of unsorted boxes of personal artist papers, it garnered interest and support in the work of the library as both a creator and a facilitator of research and research outcomes. The 
publishing, exhibitions, digital projects on art and artists were made possible by a small committed team. And for a long time that was just myself and the archivist Caroline McBride. We were helped by the growing interest in archives as a source of inspiration for a new kind of research-based art that is now commonplace in 21st century artistic practice. We collaborated with curators, artists, other archivists and librarians, iwi organisations, learning institutions and community groups who agreed to partner with us on projects. Everything we did required fundraising and generous supporters to achieve. In terms of library exhibitions, we started small with a display cabinet you see on the left installed outside the library for archival shows. And we worked on around 25 exhibitions for that small space over five years. In 2018, we broke out and developed a show called Collective Woman, Feminist Art Archives from the 1980s and 1990s for the suffrage 125th anniversary and it became the first all archive show in a main Auckland art gallery exhibition space and we were thrilled. And it enabled us to reach an audience of around 500,000 people a year. That's how many people visit Auckland Art Gallery in a year or a million people in the two years that it was on display. An archival show on artist Colin McCann followed, cementing the idea that archives could tell within galleries, we see it in museums, but within galleries could tell rich stories and not simply to complement or give texture to art exhibitions. This was also the case for the gallery's scholarly journal, Reading Room, which was a library project. So, of course, in addition to essays on contemporary art, we also featured an archive section. We commissioned writers to interrogate the stories told through our archival collections. The history told through the gallery's own archive was often a source of research that featured in the journal. At the same time, we also worked on a series of websites that pulled together compelling stories about our art history that all had their genesis in the archive. This included Whakamihado Lindauer Online, featuring the Māori portraits by Godfrey Lindauer and the accompanying early 19th century visitors' book from our archive. A partnership with Te Tauta Whiri, the Māori Language Commission, enabled the early Te Reo Māori in the books to be transcribed and translated. Find New Zealand Artists is a database of over 18,000 artist names, which are sourced from the unpublished collections, such as lists of artist files, throughout art libraries in Aotearoa. Beginning as a collaboration between us and Christchurch Art Gallery, it has grown to be a national collaborative effort. The website launched in 2013 and continues today with a national steering group, including myself and many of our original members. As part of Auckland Art Gallery's major Francis Hodgkins project to celebrate the Dunedin-born artist's 150th anniversary, we developed an online catalogue raisonné with curator Mary Kisler and selected material for the archives component of the exhibition Francis Hodgkin's European Journeys. I don't know if many of you saw that when it was here. Um, and Mary and I co-edited the accompanying book, published by Auckland University Press and Thames and Hudson. And um, one of my favourite Hockin paintings is the one on the right, uh, the double portrait of two friends, um, Jane Saunders and Hannah Ritchie. And you can see photos above there of Jane um, and Hannah and with Frances sitting in between them when she was living up in Manchester in 1925. And they were school teachers uh, and they became great friends. Um, the work last year travelled to Chicago for an exhibition. So um, it's really exciting that some of Hawkins' works can be part of the global conversation. But of course, when I was working on this project, working at Auckland Art Gallery, I didn't know much about Hawkins collections really at all, so it was a great thrill um, when I started to be able to go and uh, greet my two friends um, in that painting. 
As part of the Auckland Art Gallery's project team for the New Zealand exhibition at the 2017 Venice Art Biennale, I worked on two books about this significant work by Lisa Rehana called In Pursuit of Venus. The book produced was Emissaries for the New Zealand Pavilion at the Biennale and for the Oceania exhibition at the Royal Academy in London. So working on um, projects that um, engage New Zealand artists with the global conversations was a really exciting kind of end to my, my time at Auckland Art Gallery because in 2019 I moved from an art gallery environment to Auckland Museum. Here community engagement with collections was the prime focus. I'll share a couple of examples. Uh, with Leone Samutui uh, seen here um, we initiated the Documentary Heritage Pacific Collections program. One outcome of this was a series of online toolkits about caring for family archives and caring for tapa, with videos available in English, the nine Pacific languages, and Te Reo Māori. Māori and Pacific whānau collections are not as often found in public collections, so sharing this knowledge is a way of preserving important stories within these communities. Another project was a Masters of Arts course in Museums and Cultural Heritage. And here's the class, I think, of 2020. Um, they were able to come to a couple of classes in person and then everything else was done on Zoom because this was during the lockdown. Um, so we managed to teach a class called Inside the Museum on Zoom and around about 50 staff were involved. Um, part of the idea was to try and attract um, interested students to a career in museums um, so that they could see the variety of work available. So I was really delighted that in 2021 we managed to get the class on site. At Auckland Museum we initiated a program of contemporary collecting as a way of bringing new voices into the collections. We used a few approaches, included rapid response collecting, as it's called. So uh, you see the student there um, at the uh, school strike against climate change holding her poster, which we um, asked if she would uh, donate to our collections, and she did. It's getting hot in here, so take off all your coals is now in uh, the Auckland Museum's collection. We did uh, some born digital collecting, collecting selfies. And we were really delighted that Jacinda Ardern um, donated this one on the top right um, of her taking a selfie at uh, the Pacifica Festival. We also crowdsourced items. So we did a call out for items for our Love and Loss archive show. Um, including items from people's COVID lockdown experiences, such as diaries and the toys that were placed in people's windows. So we collected some of those. More recently, I worked on a couple of photography books um, with Auckland Museum, one called Nature Boy, the photography of Olaf Peterson, a West, Auckland West Coast photographer. Um, and there's an upcoming one, I still haven't finished, but will be out in March 24 um, on early photography in Aotearoa, which is now a collaboration between Hocken, Auckland Museum and Turnbull Library. So there'll be a touring show and publication. So that's a little bit about some of the projects I've worked on in my, I guess it's around about 30 years now I've worked in libraries. Um, so I'll move on now to the second part of my talk, which will focus on my role as the fairly newly recently appointed 10th Hocken Librarian last year. And here's an image uh, from the collection of the, of the um, Hocken Library's first home in the purpose-built Hocken Library wing of Otago Museum. Does anyone recognise that? From that? Yeah. yeah.
and we moved, um, this is, this is a snapshot site, which is being upgraded, uh, but you'll see images here of Hawkins' second home, um, which uh, was in 1979. But just to give a little bit, bit of background, and many of you will know the story of Dr. Hawkins, so I won't um, go into any detail about that, but um, just a couple of notes. Um, his priceless legacy of historical material, and I'm quoting from the New Zealand History website, is the most important collection outside crown ownership in New Zealand. Its former owner ranks alongside the country's two other famous collectors and benefactors, Sir George Grey and Alexander Turnbull. And like many others, um, he was drawn, Hockham was drawn to Dunedin during the Otago Gold Rush and arrived in 1862, making his living as a general practitioner and coroner. But the treasure he sought was not gold, but artefacts and printed material relating to New Zealand's history. And over the course of his life, Hocken amassed a personal collection of some 4,300 printed volumes and numerous other material relating to the history and settlement of New Zealand, Australia and the Pacific, with a particular emphasis on the south southern South Island and missionaries. So when he went to donate um, his entire collection to the people of New Zealand, um, he said he'd do so if a suitable building was erected in Dunedin. So this is what, what came of it. Um, and there was a public subscription campaign, which in today's money they raised about half a million dollars. Um, and that was matched pound for pound by the government. And the University of Otago accepted Hawkins' gift in 1907. And on the 31st of March 1910, this wing was officially opened. But a brand new brutalist style building designed by McCoy and Whipson on the main Otago campus housed the Hocken collections from 1979. Um, these are some older images from, from the 1990s, but um, that building, of course, is still um, around today and is heritage listed. And this was our next home when it was a dairy factory. So. The dairy factory was built in the 1950s, around about 1954, and the company made Huia brand cheese and butter, and the little Huia bird, if you visit Hocken, you can still see the little bird on some of the doorways. Um, it was refurbished for Hocken um, and opened in 1998. So we'll be celebrating, you can see how, how much it was refurbished, that was a big job, inside and out. Um, so we'll be celebrating 25 years in the building on the 2nd of December this year. So, who are we at Hockham? So my role as Hockham Librarian at the University has two portfolios. One is to provide strategic leadership and management for Hockham Collections and the University Library's special collections. And the other is to foster strong external relationships and partnerships. My role is part of the library's executive management group, which leads the direction for the whole of the library service across all of Otago's campuses nationwide. Now, Hocken has a fantastic team with a wide range of skills and experience. We include curators, librarians, archivists, technicians, a registrar, collection and general assistants, all based at our building on Anzac Avenue, a few minutes walk from the university's main campus. And we have the benefit of having all our collections housed on site. And some of you may be aware that we have the new residential college, Te Rangihiroa, opening next year, across the road from us, so we'll literally have hundreds of students on our doorstep. So what do we do? Creating meaningful connections to historic and contemporary recorded memories is a key part of working with documentary heritage collections. A large part of my role as Hocken librarian is to ensure Hocken is visible in its work and demonstrates its value to the university, the city and the nation. 
we aspire for Hocken to be tatility led, engaged with research and researchers, home to extraordinary collections, a destination both on site and online, a centre for teaching and learning, and active in the cultural life of the city and the nation. So here are some of the key activity areas for Hocken, with public engagement, both on site and online, being a growing part of our work for both the university and the wider research and source communities. Our collections, which continually grow and need to be described, cared for and managed, are used by up to 6,000 researchers a year, both on site and through remote inquiry. The Hocken also supports the teaching and learning and research needs of the academics and students from the University of Otago, Otago Polytechnic, local secondary schools, as well as other academic, professional and independent researchers. We have around 1,000 participants per year in over 60 classes. Another key feature of Hocken is that our collections are geographically focused. We collect material on Aotearoa, New Zealand and the Pacific, with a particular emphasis on Otago and Southland. So here are the numbers. We have 400,000 published volumes, including newspapers, journals and serials. There is roughly 11 kilometres, if you, you know, measure them all end to end, of archives. We have 21,000 items of recorded music and over 3,500 music sheets. Our audiovisual material comprises over 1,000 New Zealand motion picture films, television and documentary titles. 20,000 posters, 12,000 maps, and 300 metres of printed ephemera. So I haven't yet um, got to know the collections fully, and I think it will take many, many years to do so. So I think that project-based approach um, will help me in understanding the collections better once I start working on some of the material. So anyway, the numbers don't tell you everything, but the significance of Hawkins collections are underscored by its strong presence on the UNESCO Memory of the World Register for Aotearoa New Zealand. Out of 49 registrations, eight documentary heritage collections are from Hockham, including the papers of Charles Brash, Colin and Anne McCann, and James Herries Beatty. We also have one of the most comprehensive New Zealand and Pacific art collections with over 18,000 works dating from the 18th century voyages through to contemporary artists. The photographs collection includes well over a million historic images with about another million housed within archival collections from all over New Zealand, the Pacific, early Australia and Antarctica. Another important engagement activity for us is the exhibition shown at the Hocken Gallery, often drawn from our own collections. Each year, we also collaborate with the University of Otago's Francis Hodgkins Fellow to present an exhibition and publication featuring the new art made during their year-long artist residency. Emily Hartley Scudder is the 2023 Fellow and will be showing her work in February next year. It's none of what you see here, um, but it's going to be very interesting. Um, we'll be announcing our full 2024 exhibition program very soon. Hocken also has an active publishing program. Some of you may be, um, had seen Joe Lestrange Painter and we produced a book uh, for that exhibition and Sorowit Song Satire's Niran. These are two recent examples. And on Thursday, we're launching Bridget Rewiti's Francis Hodgkins Fellowship book, Pokai Whenua, Pokai Moana, which will be our first fully bilingual publication in English and Te Reo Māori. In looking to the future, we've been greatly assisted in creating a pathway forward by the review of the Hocken Collections by the University of Otago's Quality Advancement Unit, which took place in October 2021. The review had 37 wide-ranging recommendations covering these areas that have provided a blueprint for the future. 
These have evolved from Hockham team's good work in many of these areas, but with a greater focus and strategic direction. Some key areas identified were enhancing digital access, strengthening ties to teaching and research, engaging more strongly with Te Ao Māori, Pacifica communities, and in developing both our physical spaces and online presence. So our starting points have been to develop a strategic framework, including a new library and digital strategy, recruitment and development of new roles, increasing our digital presence, and developing partnerships and relationships to encourage collaboration. A new position of Head Curator Māori has been established with Jacinta Beckwith in the middle on the right, uh, appointed earlier this year. And two new curatorial roles have been developed uh, to align Hocken Published and the University's special collections. Kirsty Roth, on the far right, has been appointed Head Curator Published and Special Collections. She's formerly of the Tasmanian Museum and Art Gallery and for many years was the History Curator at Te Papa. She, that photo shows her recently hosting manuscript specialist Christopher de Hamel at Special Collections. We were also delighted to welcome Hope Wilson as our new curator art. Hope is uh, on the left there. Hope recently completed a successful three-year tenure as director of the Blue Oyster Art Project space. Roles have also been developed to support an enhanced digitisation programme at Hockham. Bringing together the digital units from across the library, a newly developed digital capture unit at Hockham will include three photographers dedicated to digital programs. The Hockham's digital delivery platform, formerly known as Snapshot, is being revamped with 50,000 images planned for release on a new look site in mid-October. We also have an ongoing program of digitisation which we plan to grow greatly in the future. Most recently, stories are emerging from a cache of around 6,000 glass plate negatives and lantern slides dating from about the 1890s to the 1940s. The slice of life in Dunedin is gradually being digitised. Quoting my colleague, archivist David Murray, they say every photo tells a story, but every photo tells more than one story. This image taken in 1918 at North East Valley Normal School, think about what strikes you. The children with their soft toys, an American flag with 1917 on it at the back, noting the date the US entered World War I. These sorts of elements highlight the importance of descriptive practice and access. And if anyone can identify anyone, that's another great, great thing to put into the record. So it's not just the image that counts. Hocken also contains archives of particular significance to Kaitahu, and alumni funding is enabling us to start a pilot project working with Runaka and Kaitahu archives on identifying and digitising key material. To support this work, Rohina Scott Fife has been appointed to a new position of Māori archivist, supported by the William Evans Alumni Fund, an advisory group with representation from Runaka and Naitahu archives has been established to work on priorities for digitising. Access and cultural permissions and sharing of knowledge for record descriptions. The Harry's Beatty papers were identified as a key archive for digitisation by the advisory group. Digitisation of the entire archive is being made possible by a university alumni grant. The Harry's Beatty papers document the traditional knowledge and memories of 19th century South Island Māori, a great deal of it based on conversations and interviews with James Harry's Beatty over the course of a lifetime of research. In 2018, these papers were registered on the UNESCO New Zealand Memory of the World. New Zealand Micrographic Services will be on site at Hocken to digitise the papers starting next week. Mm -hmm. So we're ramping up, and we'll be finishing that work by mid-October. So 
So collaborations and community engagement also extends to exhibitions. And Bev Moon's Knitted Yum Cha Feast Fortune is our current exhibition that also includes collection responses to Chinese experiences in Otago from Hocken in collaboration with the Presbyterian Research Centre at Knox College and the Otago Southland Chinese Association. And Bev spoke on RNZ National on Sunday and talked um, about the relationship um, of this work to the Chinese community, particularly in this part of the world. Uh, it's worth having a listen um, to her exploration of this work and of the history that it relates to. We've also recently partnered with Tavaka Cook Islands of Dunedin to add to our collection oral history project that celebrates the lives of a number of Otipoti Cook Islands community members alongside a foyer display for Cook Islands Language Week that featured listening posts for the interviews and photos of the people interviewed. So what next for Hockham? My first 12 months were about recruitment, relationships, digital, um, among other things. Um, and the next 12 months will be a focus on collections, our building and our storage needs. The Hocken Collection Development Policy Review is a big project that will involve many internal and external stakeholders, and certainly the other cultural heritage institutions around the city. We're part of a network of libraries and collections, and if we work together, we will amplify the synergies of cultural collections, not just within the university, but across the city. At Hocken, our physical spaces particularly in regards to providing more social space for our visitors and more breathing space for our collections will be another focus area. Thank you. I'll, I'll stop there um, and see if anyone has any questions. I'd better start with the... Oh, should I start there? <laughs> Look through them and then look at everything we have yeah. before we actually put on the sale. Mm. What are you actually looking for when you, you know, what kind of sort of... Yes, well we're probably, probably some of our curators in the published area have a bit of a wish list. <coughs> uh, because finding different editions of um, Southland histories, finding uh, material that even sort of contemporary books that you might think, oh well they're bound to have them. <laughs> um, it's often good even to get another copy or to have a sense of what we might have missed, so there's always that sort of gap filling. The stories of people I think are really, really important from this part of the world um, to have it at Hocken. Um, I think we will be looking at having a slightly sharper focus for our collection because you know, print collections in the 20th century grew to the point where we're not the only ones finding it hard to find space. Um, so it is, we do have to be selective, but we also have to represent our communities uh, and our region well. So yeah, we're always, always going to be collecting. Is the Hopkin caught up in the university review? Yes, I mean, Hocken is part of the university, and I'd like to think um, a treasured part of the university. And in my time here, I've felt a great deal of support um, from the university at large. I think across the country, and you know, I, I, I guess I'm old enough to remember the cycles of economies. And I feel like I've been here before, I don't know if some, you know, uh, that you there's expansion and then there's contraction. But I actually believe that even within a contraction um, of an economy, you know, if you use your imagination and do things in different ways, there's always, it's not always about money, is it? It's about will and commitment and sharing and being open. So yes, uh, for all the universities across the country, it's a really difficult time and people are having to make tough decisions, but you know, it's, it's within all of us to make a difference, I think. Oh, yeah. 
when you said that the first site was at the museum, you said it was owned by the university, but wasn't that a museum that was under the DCC? So the university um, run the Hocken site at the museum? Yeah, that's a good oh, question. I, th I think there was, back in the day, uh, the lines were a little bit more blurry between the institutions. That's my sense of it. So the, the collections, were uh, uh, gifted and trust to the university, but the building was at Otago Museum. And the payment for that wing was through the generosity of the people here and central government. So it wasn't, qu it wasn't quite as compartmentalised as perhaps we see it today, is my impression here. <laughs> I just got confused. But the collections themselves were always held in trust with the, with the university. Okay. Yeah. 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 Even though the physical space was at the, at the museum. Yeah. You mentioned the Charles Brash papers. I think they were in Marco for 50 years or something like that. Well, I, and I wondered if now that they're accessible, the reason for that embargo was clear. Yeah, I mean, I think he was, um, you know, uh, a complex person um, who, as we all know, probably had to um, hide parts of his personal life because of the, the nature of the times in which he lived. And so there were probably intimations that, you know, how does one put it, that he was very much a confirmed bachelor uh, within those papers. So I think there were probably parts of that that, um, <coughs> you know, for, for himself and maybe his friends and his family uh, at the time, the embargo just meant that perhaps times would catch up with him, which indeed they had. <laughs> and we can really celebrate his full life. <coughs> Well, if there's no other questions, I'll thank you very much. The Hopping Collection is such a tall honour, and we just want to keep it in your donation, in your trusts, and work with everyone. And I'll say for people that have not done it, you have free tours that you can do behind the scenes. Is it one Wednesday a month or every Wednesday? We do it um, on a Thursday. Thursday, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. And it's absolutely excellent. You go through all the stacks and you see things like the knitting patterns and the yeah. posters and I actually yeah. found it fabulous. Yeah. So um, on a Thursday. Yeah. 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 So thank you very much for coming very and welcome. sharing your knowledge. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Now feel free to have any leftover food and drink.